Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the LSE, to our annual LCAA, LSE arbitration debate. My name is Jan Klein Heisterkamp. I'm an associate professor here at the London School of Economics for Law. And um, this is our third joint LCAA, LSE arbitration debate, and indeed our eighth LSE arbitration debate, which we started eight years ago when uh, Jan Paulsen was uh, our centennial professor here. I'm very pleased to welcome tonight our guests. We have uh, Mr. Bruce Bullis from Quake. Bruce Harris. That is a good start. <laughs> Almost. Bruce Harris. I'm sorry, Bruce. Of Quadrant Quadrin Chambers. <laughs> you're, a, you're a heavy puncher, that's why. Um, and the past president of the LMAA. We have uh, Nigel Rording, uh, QC, partner and former head of international arbitration of Freshfields. And we have our moderator, Mr. Zuba Akta, the head of litigation of Siemens at the UK. Tonight's um, debate will be recorded, so please bear that in mind. And uh, please put your telephones off the obvious uh, indications. And if someone uses Twitter, which I think it's more politicians than academics doing that, but anyway, um, you can use the hashtag uh, at LSE, LCIA, all together. And then, of course, we will have, after the debate, the opportunity to, to ask questions. So please stay with us and build up to that moment. I hand over to Jackie, please. Thank you very much, Jan. Thank you very much, uh, uh, debaters and moderator, for being here tonight with us. Thank you to the audience. Um, half of the audience is here. Half of the audience is on their way. Um, the, this is the third uh, LCA LSE uh, pre moot debate which we decided to um, start holding on the Friday evening before the pre vis moot in, uh, in London. And the idea was that the uh, debaters who are here for a whole weekend, uh, the, 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 the vis mooters who are here for a whole weekend, um, arrive on the Friday so they can get to know each other and get to, get to know some of the arbitrators who will be uh, acting as arbitrators over the course of the weekend. So we have many of the arbitrators here. The students are on their way from Heathrow, Gatwick, and wherever, but we will start. Um, we found the opportunity to, to collaborate with LSE especially interesting because London, unlike some of the places where pre-moots are being organized, actually has a lot of arbitrators and, and, and not only uh, the students and the junior uh, uh, potential arbitrators. So we teamed up with LSE to um, bring our address book, if you will, to the game, and we're very grateful to those of you who are acting as arbitrator over the course of the weekend. Then when we started uh, organizing the debate, that created uh, an extra opportunity to add some content to the event. And as you know, the the moot typically focuses on a, a Vienna sales convention uh, 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 dispute. Um, with a large uh, uh, arbitration procedural component. Last year, the uh, problem had a large challenge component, um, which some of you arbitrators may remember. So this year, when we were looking for a topic for tonight, it seemed too good to be true because we currently have an active, a real challenge issue that is keeping the London community intrigued. And I should sh say not just the London community, it is something which also international practitioners from overseas are very much interested in. This is the Halley Burton versus Chubb case, a case which is going to the Supreme Court and will be heard there in November. And what is quite unique about the case is that several arbitration institutions and stakeholders have intervened in the process at least to uh, obtain leave to appeal and will be seeking leave to intervene in the actual Supreme Court proceedings. That includes the LCIA. Um, why? Well, that's what you're going to be hearing effectively today. The debate tonight will not be about the case per se, but will be focusing on the issues that come out of this case, which are truly fundamental. The independence and impartiality, although that's already, I would say, a leading introduction perhaps to, uh, to the debate, is a fundamental basis for arbitration, and if we want to keep London the premier place of arbitration, it is in everyone's interest that the judiciary supports practitioners in London when it comes to arbitrators' uh, impartiality. 
I look forward to the debate. I look forward to the weekend. I also should say I already look forward to next year's debate because next year the VIS will be uh, conducted on the basis of the LCIA rules. Um, so I look forward to seeing many of you then both here in London and in Vienna. But for now, I'd like to hand over to our moderator and good luck to the debaters. <coughs> Here and the next slide will appear. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie, for that kind introduction. Um, just by way of introduction, I'm Sue Barakther um, from Siemens in the UK. Um, it's an honor and a privilege to be moderating this dispute, and I'd just like to get a couple of things out of the way first. This is my first moderating of a dispute, and um, I wasn't sure why I was selected or how you moderate a dispute. So the first thing I did was do a, an advanced Google search on moderating an LCIA debate at the LSE between Bruce Harris and Nigel Rording. <laughs> and uh, the response that came back from Google was, call Jeremy Kyle. Um, I did that, and Jeremy came back with a response. Dear Suber, I'm used to tough debaters. I can handle machete-wielding gang members on my show, but moderating a debate between Nigel Rording and Bruce Harris is too tough for me. And that's why um, I'm here, I think. But in all honesty, it is an absolute honor to be moderating a dispute between these two very eminent and fantastic lawyers who will put forward their views on this very important case and the issues that it raises. So without further ado, we will start with a brief overview of the case. I'm sure many of you in this room will have probably memorized the um, uh, Chubb, uh, Halliburton and Chubb cases, but very briefly, uh, the subject matter is the Deepwater Horizon oil rig, um, which had an explosion in the Gulf of Mexico in 2010 with the disastrous oil spill, all of which led to some very large claims and follow-on litigation. Um, the parties involved were, uh, number one, Transocean, who was the owner of the rig. There was also BP, who was the lessee. Um, Halliburton, who provided certain services, including cementing and monitoring services. Um, Chubb, who were the insurers, and as we'll find out, an arbitrator called M, who had several referrals. Um, the relevant law is um, Section 24 of the Arbitration Act 1996, which allows for removal of an arbitrator where circumstances exist that give rise to justifiable doubts as to his impartiality. Um, uh, Nigel and I had a debate about the phrase dramatis personae, and he corrected me that that was the more correct one than saying the parties. Um, I put it in to win a bet that I could get some Latin into my slide. Um, if we turn to this slide, um, which I put together, will hopefully illustrate in a graphic form the subject matter we're talking about. So very briefly, um, reference one is the key matter which is the subject of the dispute, which was between Halliburton and Chubb. Now, Halliburton had paid out quite a substantial sum of money to claimants following the um, oil rig disaster and then sought to claim on its insurance from Chubb. Chubb refused on several bases, including that the settlements were not reasonable and they had not consented to it. Before that appointment, um, M had disclosed that he had been involved as arbitrator and other disputes involving Chubb, and there were two current appointments. So that was disclosed. The two parties, Halliburton and Chubb, um, nominated their own arbitrator, but couldn't agree on the chairman, and the High Court of England uh, put, appointed M as the arbitrator, who was incidentally Chubb's preferred arbitrator. So as that arbitration is going on, which we'll call reference one, Along came reference two in December 2015, which as you can see from the X's, was between Transocean against Chubb. Again, the arbitrator was M, and the subject matter, which is at the end, was deep water. In reference two, the arbitrator disclosed to um, Transocean that he had an appointment under reference one, but crucially, he did not disclose to Halliburton in reference one that he was being appointed in reference two. Furthermore, there was a further reference in August 2016, which we'll call reference three, again, this time between Transocean and a different insurer, 
Um, and yet again, the arbitrator was M, and the subject matter was deep water. And again, he did not disclose um, this referral to this appointment in re reference three um, in, uh, to Halliburton for reference one. Anyway, Halliburton subsequently found out and asked for an explanation um, because they contended that this was in breach of the IBA guidelines on the conflicts of interest in our international arbitration. Um, the arbitrator responded uh, that he didn't think his independence and impartiality was an issue, but he did say that he appreciated, and I quote, with the benefit of hindsight, it would have been prudent for me to have informed your clients through your firm. Um, he also confirmed that both arose from the Deepwater Horizon incident, but he did state, and I quote again, this did not raise the same or similar issues. Um, this particular bit is crucial for me as a client, is that M actually offered to resign, but only if um, Chubb would consent, and Chubb declined that consent. So Halliburton brought a challenge, as I said, pursuant to Section 24 of the Arbitration Act, um, and it was heard by Justice Popperwell. Um, he declined the challenge, and then it went to the Court of Appeal. And again, the Court of Appeal uh, found in uh, Chubb's favor and declined the appeal. There were several issues raised, one of which was uh, the concept of inside information and knowledge. And if you just look at the graph there, what that means is, in, by virtue of reference two and three, the uh, common party, which is Chubb, would have certain knowledge that they may be able to use in reference one. Also, the arbitrator may be influenced by information that he has in references two and three, which isn't put to him in reference one. Um, so those were some of the issues, and we will debate them. Um, as Jackie has said, this is going to the uh, Supreme Court. It's one of very importance. And the three issues that we will be debating today are, number one, when, if ever, is too much knowledge a dangerous thing? Two, does multiple appointments and small pools result in too much knowledge? And three, is disclosure the answer? Uh, the process we will follow is I will invite Nigel to take the lead on issue one, with Bruce then responding to that. Bruce will then go first on issue two, does multiple appointments and small pools result in too much knowledge, with Nigel then responding. And then finally, Nigel will take the lead, is disclosure the answer, and Bruce responding. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Nigel. When, if ever, is too much knowledge a dangerous thing? Thank you very much, uh, Super. I hope, I hope I can remember that um, sequencing. Um, it sounds a bit complicated, but I, I'm, sure we'll, I'm sure we'll get that. So, um, by way of my introduction, uh, the maxim that a little knowledge is a dangerous thing, apt to mislead others into thinking an individual is more expert than he or she really is, is well known. Although, uh, allowing myself a personal reflection, it can prove to be a perfectly solid foundation for a moderately successful career in the law. <laughs> the origins of the observation seem to lie with the anonymous author of a collection of letters published in 1698, uh, as under the title, The Mystery of Fanaticism. He wrote, "'Twas well observed that a little knowledge is apt to puff up and make men giddy, but a greater share of it will set them right and bring them to low and humble thoughts of themselves. Now, as we know, the world of international arbitration is populated entirely by those with low and humble thoughts of themselves, suggesting that they do not have too little knowledge. But we're here to debate the contrary proposition that too much knowledge can be a dangerous thing, and I say that it can. But first of all, what, what do we mean by knowledge? That question has exercised the minds of at least two great thinkers. At the beginning of the 16th century, the mathematician and astronomer Copernicus, who was no slouch when it came to such things, wrote, to know that we know what we know, and to know that we do not know what we do not know, that is true knowledge. And getting on for 500 years later, the then US Secretary, Secretary of State for Defense, Donald Rumsfeld, you know where I'm going with this, but I never tire of, 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 of hearing it, or in this case, reading it, Reports that say something hasn't happened are always interesting to me because, we, uh, as we know, there are known knowns. There are things we know we know. We also know there are known unknowns. That is to say, we know there are things we do not know. But there are also unknown unknowns. 
the ones we don't know we don't know. And we need to bear that last point in mind when we come to uh, consider some of the issues about insider knowledge. So having cleared that up, we're here to wrestle with the more prosaic examination of what type of knowledge may be helpful and what type of knowledge might be unhelpful or give rise to problems in the selection and appointment of arbitrators to decide commercial disputes. In the arbitration context, there's no doubt that knowledge is a very useful attribute. Indeed, understandably enough, we typically select arbitrators precisely because of their knowledge. Of course, we also like arbitrators who we might consider to be good lawyers, who may be able to evaluate evidence and legal arguments on their merits, and who are perceived to be fair and efficient and not too rude. But a lot of the factors that go into selecting arbitrators go to knowledge. For instance, we are often looking for an arbitrator's existing knowledge of the law. In an English law-governed dispute, one may be predisposed to ensure that you have at least one English law-qualified arbitrator on the tribunal. In the IBA guidelines on conflict of interest to which we may return, previously expressed and published legal opinions concerning an issue that may arise in an arbitration are treated as a matter not giving rise to any actual or perceived conflict and do not require disclosure. That instance appears on the so-called green list. Of course, there may come a point where an arbitrator has expressed a view on a narrow point in such trenchant terms that he or she may not be suitable for appointment on grounds of issue conflict, but so far, so good. But what about knowledge of a factual nature? Consider, for example, an arbitrator's knowledge and experience derived from practicing in or advising clients from different jurisdictions. It may be considered important that the arbitrator has knowledge of how business is conducted in certain parts of the world versus others when seeking to establish the common intention of the parties to a commercial contract. What about sector-specific or other technical knowledge? Why wouldn't an oil and gas supermajor prefer to select an arbitrator who understands the basics of the oil and gas industry, who knows the difference between a JOA from a PSC? Or in a very technical dispute, why wouldn't it be useful to have an arbitrator with an engineering or accounting background, as the case may be? But factual knowledge can go further. What if an arbitrator already knows something about the facts of the case itself? For example, if he or she has already arbitrated a dispute between different parties arising out of the same underlying facts? Or what if an arbitrator has deep knowledge of one of the other parties involved in the dispute from previous experience as an arbitrator or even as an advisor? Or a deep knowledge of that party's usual legal advisors through the same means? So that's what I mean by knowledge, and, and you can always already get a sense that the, 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 the further one goes, the more problematic it, it, it might become. What does Halliburton have to say about knowledge? One of the factual aspects of the case uh, noted in Mr. Justice Popplewell's first instance decision was that M was described as having extensive experience of insurance and reinsurance law, both English and New York law, and that he had sat as a member of an arbitration tribunal in over 30 references concerning the Bermuda form, the policy and issue in Halliburton. No doubt the, ju the judge observed that, that is one reason why M had previously been appointed by Chubb and why he was also being sought out as an arbitrator in other, other, other disputes relating to Deepwater Horizon. Is there anything wrong with choosing such an obviously one well-qualified individual? Well, in his excellent critique of the Court of Appeal decision in Halliburton, which upheld the judgment of Mr. Justice Popplewell, Paul Stanley QC, himself greatly experienced in, in Bermuda form arbitrations, observed as follows. An arbitrator who has been appointed in many Bermuda form cases is likely to have decided one or more of a small number of disputable points before. It is sometimes suspected that a particular appointee has been chosen because the appointor knows through experience that the arbitrator's convictions align with the case it, the appointor, expects to make. And that is quite apart from a second concern that Stanley mentions, where an arbitrator appointed in several, arb several arbitrations arising out of the same underlying set of facts will bring to the hearing room views or assumptions formed in other references on the basis of other evidence. Now, why might this be a problem? There's an appealing argument, which I have a sense Bruce might make, uh, to suggest that previous knowledge of facts is useful. Why should I have to educate my arbitrator about the underlying facts if I can appoint someone who already knows? The same could be said for market practice if the matter is in dispute between the parties. Ditto technical issues. I feel, sh feel sure Bruce will say that, the, that a process conducted by such arbitrators would be cheaper faster and more predictable. 
But even assuming those claims are necessarily brought out, borne out in practice, we need to consider three primary areas of risk. One, there is a risk that too much knowledge can lead an arbitrator to decide a case on the basis of his or her pre-existing knowledge rather than what is argued or presented by the parties. This goes against a fundamental task of the arbitrator, recognized in most arbitration rules, laws, and conventions around the world, to act fairly and impartially as between the parties and giving each the opportunity to put their case and respond to that of their opponent. Indeed, deciding a case on the basis of pre-existing knowledge is in, is in uh, some sense no different from an arbitrator pursuing a completely new line of inquiry, whether by way of independent research or asking a third party for its view without the involvement of the parties. Such an approach was recently criticized by the English court in a 2018 case involving two legendary football teams from the northwest of England. I'm referring, of course, to Fleetwood Town Football Club and AFC Fylde. The contractual dispute between the clubs con concerned in part the status of FIFA's regulations on the status and, tr and transfer of players incorporated into the, into the Football Association's own rules. Without informing the parties, the sole arbitrator emailed the judicial services manager of the FA, whom he knew, to seek his view on the issue on a no-names basis, and also carried out some research of his own on the point. The FA solicitors disclosed the emails to the parties, to the arbitration, and that gave rise to a challenge. His Honour Judge Halliwell, sitting as a judge of the, of the High Court, concluded that by making the relevant inquiries and eliciting information without, a, without at least sharing the information with the parties and giving them the opportunity to make representations, the arbitrator committed a breach of his general duties under the Act, uh, and that led to the award being remitted to the sole arbitrator for further consideration with a somewhat muted as uh, admonishment. The judge noted that the parties are entitled to assume that the tribunal will base its decision solely on the evidence and argument presented by them prior to the making of the award. And if the tribunal are minded to decide the dispute, the dispute on some other point, the tribunal must give notice of it to the parties to enable them to address it. Indeed, it should not be controversial to indicate that an arbitrator's function is not to supply evidence, but rather to adjudicate upon the evidence presented to it. Is the position any different, one might ask, where, based on previous experience, the arbitrator already knows the answer in his or her, uh, already knows the answer to the question in his or her mind without having to pursue that further line of inquiry. But secondly, the pre-existing knowledge uh, in the minds of, of, of the arbitrator may have been acquired in a way that lead, leads a re reasonable observer to question the impartiality of the arbitrator. For instance, one might acquire such knowledge of market practice by working closely with leading participants, participants in the market in question. And what if a dispute involves one of those leading participants or, an, or a company or, a, or an individual affiliated with it? And what if the arbitrator in question knows all of this, but its counterpart does not? The appointer in question knows this, but the, the, the counterpart does not. That gives rise, amongst other things, to the insider knowledge issue that Suba touched on in his introduction, where the outsider is or may be prejudiced. But third, if we present the need for this knowledge as non-negotiable, we artificially shrink the pool of available arbitrators. And this has implications not in only in relation to our, our arbitrator availability and possibly also diversity in general, but also increases the likelihood of overlapping appointments, as was the case in Halliburton. Now, it will be said that um, a, a, an already well-informed arbitrator, uh, including matters of fact and market practice, will result in, in the conduct of the proceedings being more efficient and, and more predictable. Uh, but I say that you need to weigh that against the harm uh, that I've indicated, or risk factors I've indicated, of too much knowledge. And if the arbitrator is going to be influenced in making a decision on a disputed point by his or her own knowledge, that is going to have to be put to the parties anyway with the opportunity to present um, arguments uh, in opposition. And perhaps that should always be the practice. Um, the arbitration rules of another well-known arbitral institution based in Paris expressly require the tribunal to take account of any relevant trade usages. But the Paris-based Secretariat's guidance on the rules notes that it is up to any party wishing to rely on a trade usage to prove its existence, content, and meaning. A party may do so in many different ways, such as through trade publications and guidelines and or expert testimony. There is no mention of appointing an arbitrator with his or her preconceived notion 
of or experience of what that trade usage, trade usage might be. But it may be worse than that uh, to have an arbitrator with pre-existing knowledge because he brings or he, she brings a, a lot of baggage to the um, process um, and may not be able to approach uh, the dispute in question with an open mind. Imagine that, an arbitrator who has already made up his or her mind before hearing the party's representatives. And we also need to recognize that the arbitration, uh, the nature of arbitration today has changed uh, dramatically from some of its uh, more humble beginnings. We're no longer in a bygone era where arbitrators were chosen as wise or good men. They were always, of course, men to decide disputes between merchants according to custom and practice and the lex mercatoria of the day. It's questionable whether we'd even call that process arbitration as we understand, uh, understand it today, a process which is supported by judicial, judicial systems ar around the world when it comes to enforcing agreements and, and awards. But uh, if parties are so concerned to appoint tribunals with that pre-existing knowledge, one might wonder whether what they're really looking for, I want to see some suggestion of this in some of the cases that we might look at, it is a form of expert adjudication rather than arbitration at all. There's nothing wrong with that as a process. It's a very useful process, but it's just, not, um, it's just different from, from the arbitration um, concept that we are uh, concerned with. So to conclude on this opening point, we run into dangerous territory if we expect our arbitrators to know too much. We know what happened to the man who knew too much in Alfred, Alfred Hitchcock's 1956 movie of that name. And that film also featured the song, K Sarah Sarah, whatever will be, will be, adopted by generations of football supporters since with a more or less rhyming um, destination in mind, uh, whether or not they had any realistic prospect of getting to Wembley. However, the influence of fatalism and misplaced hope in arbitration may be a topic uh, for another debate on another occasion rather than this one. My conclusion is that arbitrators should be tasked with deciding disputes on the basis of the material presented by the parties, no more, no less, and discharging that fundamental duty is put at risk where an arbitrator already knows too much. Over to Bruce. Right, well, I am neither Bruce Willis nor a lawyer, so let's get that out of the way. Nigel said when we were having our preliminary discussion that we should try to avoid a heated agreement this evening. I agree. But on the other hand, I must say there are a number of points which he's raised and will, he will no doubt be raising shortly, which seem to me to be self-evident and unarguable. But I will comment on some of these as we go, although not in great detail. But whilst I may agree with some of his reasons, I don't necessarily agree with all of his conclusions. And my main approach is rather different, as you will see in a moment. Each case of perceived bias, and that's what Halliburton is really about, depends on its particular facts. And the case of Halliburton is absolutely no exception in that respect. Indeed, it seems to me there's a strong argument for saying that it should never have gone beyond first instance if it really had to go that far. On its facts, it's very particular, and those facts are unlikely to be repeated. No doubt that was in the minds of the judges who heard the case. But whether it will be in the minds of the Supreme Court is another question because so much of it has been made since the Court of Appeal decision that it now appears to be a cause celebre, a categorization which I'm not sure is merited. Further, it seems to me really to be a case on perceived bias and not knowledge as such, and the test for perceived bias is well known and I think uncontroversial. In addition, the arguments that are being deployed around the case ignore or rather tend to assume that all arbitrations are similar. Now, this is because, in my view, the so-called international arbitration community forgets that it is not alone in this world of arbitration and that there are other very substantial bodies of arbitration work going on where the approach to life and the ethos are very different. The world from which I come which is that of maritime arbitration, is a classic example. We get through a huge volume of cases. In 2017, for example, London maritime arbitrators had some 1,700 references. In contrast, the LCIA and the ICC London seated arbitrations totaled about 370, about 22% of the maritime numbers. And even if we add in an estimated 300 ad hoc 
references, an estimate which was given by the City UK Legal Services report, we find maritime arbitrators are still doing more than twice as many cases as all the others. Now, I'm very worried, and I think most of my maritime arbitration colleagues are also worried, that the Supreme Court might seek to lay down some rules that apply indiscriminately across the board and which, depending on their nature, might ultimately damage London maritime arbitration very seriously. If that were to happen, there could well be an unfortunate knock-on effect for London arbitration generally. But let me come back to the points Nigel has made so far on the question whether too much knowledge is a dangerous thing. Now, like most of us, I suspect, in early childhood, I was told that too much knowledge, not too much, I was told that too little knowledge, a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. But I was also told that ignorance is bliss. <laughs> so it surprises me that against that background I ever managed to pass any examinations. It's probably because I didn't understand what either phrase meant at the time. But the fact is that both too much knowledge and too little knowledge can be dangerous depending on the circumstances. Nigel's mentioned the possibility of having too much knowledge of the law. It is, of course, helpful to have some knowledge. But we want to avoid the example of a retired judge who always comes up with his own point, which he insists on pursuing, and which neither party has raised. I'm told he did that when he was in court, and I know from my own experience that he did that as a junior barrister possibly as a leader. On the other hand, we don't want barrack room lawyers who don't actually know anything about the law but think they do. How to strike the balance is the question. Languages can be useful, but again, command of another language is uh, risky because uh, care is required with the nuances of foreign languages. And similar considerations apply to questions of culture. In the field of maritime arbitration, uh, we see some of the problems that arise from different cultural tendencies, and we take them into account. For instance, as a result of handling many Chinese shipbuilding cases, uh, we now know that their documentary record-keeping practices are quite loose compared to those of other nationalities' yards. So what are the risks involved from having too much knowledge, whatever that means? Well, there is an ever-present risk of a tribunal deciding a case on grounds that were not argued. And it seems to me that that is a risk that will always exist. But proper training and education of arbitrators should ensure that this does not happen. In a case where the arbitrator has had particular involvement, perhaps employment, with a participant, it's very likely that disclosure will be needed whatever approach is adopted, bearing in mind the test for perceived bias. Nigel spoke about the possible benefits of knowledge. In my view, in fact, uh, the main one is that more predictable outcomes are likely. I doubt somehow that there's much to be achieved in terms of efficiency in conducting an arbitration, given the way that counsel now tend to run cases very much as if they were in court. In an oral hearing, though, a specific knowledge may manifest and help to save time. But again, it must be put to the parties, if it's relevant, and if the point has not already been drawn out in the course of argument or the examination of witnesses. One matter we should, we should perhaps reflect on when considering the knowledge of arbitrators or, or the absence thereof is that nobody seems to question judges' ability to be impartial. Although during their time at the bar, they will have acquired much knowledge, particularly if, as is the case for commercial judges, they have done a lot of, uh, for example, shipping work and are currently trying a shipping case. Of course, in addition, very often they, in, they know intimately counsel and possibly the solicitors and, and even perhaps arbitrators appearing before them. But so far as I'm aware, no one ever challenges them because of this knowledge. What are we to make of that? Is there really a good reason why arbitrators should be treated differently? Surely it's right that arbitrators should be treat, trusted as we trust judges. And I wonder whether in the Halliburton case, Mr. Justice Popplewell disclosed that he had fought many a case against M at whilst at the bar, or whether perhaps Lord Justice Hamblin disclosed that he was from the same chambers as M. Somehow I doubt it. Nigel, towards the end of his presentation, suggested that specialist knowledge results in uh, shrinking pools of available arbitrators. But 
the fact is that that is exactly the situation in which we find ourselves, whether it be in maritime cases, commodity cases, construction cases, ICSID cases, or insurance cases, because the markets in those I instances choose the arbitrators they want, and the, the numbers tend to be limited, especially uh, after they've experimented with a few of the less successful or less busy arbitrators. So I don't think that there is any risk of that sort uh, that we need to be concerned about. That was all I was going to say on this first topic. Would you like me to go straight on? Yes. Okay. Just, uh, topic two. Yeah, topic two. Topic two, um, Sube put as being, do multiple appointments and small pools result in too much knowledge? Well, I suppose it's inevitable that when arbitrators specialize, as we do tend to, they acquire certain knowledge, just as judges do from the, their practice at the bar and indeed practice as judges. But I am speaking from the point of view an from an arbitrator who predominantly practices in maritime arbitration, which I suppose counts as a small pool because there are only 30 full members of our association, the Professional Association, the London Maritime Arbitrators Association, and of those, I estimate that only 18 are doing any substantial amount of the work. And of those 18, the bulk of that work is done probably by six or eight people at the outside. Now, it may be that uh, there are perceived to exist small pools in other areas of arbitration. I don't know. But so far as I know, they're not formalized in the sense of not having a membership of a, a particular association. Be that as it may, the situation in maritime arbitration is particular, and this is acknowledged by the IBA in the IBA guidelines, although only in a footnote. And it says, and I quote, it may be the practice in certain types of arbitration, such as maritime, sports, or commodities arbitration, to draw arbitrators from a smaller or specialized pool of individuals. Now, I wonder how the IBA came to use the phrase may be when it most certainly is the practice in maritime and commodities arbitrations, at least. I can't speak about sports. And I suspect that this reflects what I said earlier about the so-called international arbitration community ignoring or being largely unaware of the rest of us. It seems to me inevitable that in a more or less specialized industry, such as shipping, parties will tend to appoint from a fairly small pool of arbitrators. The limited number of arbitrators who are members of the LMAA suggests this. Indeed, I think we've never ever had more than 45 members. Uh, and uh, so does the fact, in fact, to a greater extent, that a relatively small proportion of those members do the bulk of the work. In addition, it's been found impossible to recruit new arbitrators, making people members of the association who are not being appointed by the market achieves nothing. We have to depend on the market at making appointments, identifying who they want to have as the arbitrators. The question is, uh, how do we deal with any perceived issues that arise from the circumstance of having a small pool of arbitrators who inevitably know certain things? At least for us in the shipping field, uh, any idea of removing the power of parties to appoint their arbitrators is inconceivable. Shipping parties will simply not entertain that or any suggestion that the arbitrators should be appointed by some outside body. Experience has shown that shipping people do not want institutional arbitration and the figures uh, that are produced by the ICC and the LCIA tend to support that view. People in shipping put arbitration clauses into their contracts, usually providing for each party to appoint their own arbitrator and they're very reluctant to change those clauses not least because they perceive some value in having their own nominees. It may be suggested that arbitrators should limit the number of appointments that they take. Well, to my mind, this is only relevant as regards possible delay. And in London maritime arbitration, there are no problems in that respect. Uh, further, in our case, if an arbitrator is unable to offer an early hearing date, he is bound, under the terms on the basis of which we work, to resign and be replaced. Uh, any idea that it might help if we had arbitration awards published along with the arbitrator's identities 
so that parties can identify particular arbitrators' tendencies is anathema. What this leads to is arbitrators being appointed for their known or at least their perceived bias. And I think the idea is that we're trying to get away from that. An arbitrator who is appointed in such circumstances will know uh, that he has been so appointed and he'll find it very difficult to leave his uh, approach to a problem that he may have adopted in the past. Uh, the evidence for this is that publication of awards has been the practice in New York maritime arbitration for many, many years. One effect of it has been that because arbitrators are consequently appointed for their known or perceived biases, almost every New York arbitration award is uh, given by a majority and the dissentient is invariably the arbitrator appointed by the losing party. That is not helpful. And it may be why, over the last 20 years or so, New York arbitration numbers have dwindled so much that uh, they are simply no, no longer a threat to London maritime arbitration. The IBA guidelines refer to limits on appointments by the same firm of lawyers. And again, at least in a specialist field, it seems to me that multiple appointments from the same source are inevitable. There is a limited number of firms in, of solicitors in London handling shipping cases. And with the limited number of arbitrators that the market has chosen to appoint repeatedly, it is bound to happen that we get numerous appointments from the same law firm. London is a hugely popular venue for arbitration generally and particularly for maritime arbitration. As I've said, in 2017, London maritime arbitrators had some 1,700 references, whilst the other major competitors, Singapore, Hong Kong and Paris together, managed about 200 only. And I think the attraction of London arises because of the long history of commercial law and its flexibility, as well as the flexibility available in procedures. At least in the shipping and commodity small pool areas, we have had no problems with uh, questions of perceived bias. English pragmatism has prevailed. This is probably another reason for London's popularity. I say let us continue in that way. If we don't, we may all suffer. Um, thank you, uh, Bruce, and thank you for the opportunity to respond, um, Suba. Let me say um, a word about um, a topic that, that Bruce mentioned in, in reply to the, to, to, to the first um, point on knowledge. Uh, and he, he said something about uh, ju judges being um, treated uh, or arbitrators being treated uh, differently from judges, and, w and why should that be? Um, I would not want to suggest that arbitrators should be held to a higher, lower, or different standard when it comes to impartiality or avoiding um, the appearance of, of bias. Uh, but it is important to recognize that there are some differences between judges and arbitrators and the processes by which uh, and under which they are appointed. Um, arbitrators are chosen by the parties. Uh, they're, they're selected for nomination um, because of research that is conducted in relation to them. Judges are appointed by the state to hear a case that comes on to his or her docket. There's no influence in, in, in party nomination in that sense. Arbitrations are conducted largely in private uh, and their awards are confidential. Judges sit in open court for the most part and their, judge, and their judgments can be scrutinized by, by all, not just by insiders. Uh, and finally, um, judges' decisions are open to appeal where uh, for, for most purposes arbitration awards are not. So, I do think to suggest that there is some problem or difficulty in arbitrations being treated differently from judges it doesn't fairly reflect the difference uh, between the two processes and, and, and the resulting um, degree of scrutiny and information available to the community at large and not just those in the know. But I want to respond on the multiple appointments and small pools point. Um, I've tried to explain how, as a matter of principle, we need to be careful about relying too, much, too heavily on the pre-existing knowledge of arbitrators 
for fear of usurping the role of an arbitrator in deciding disputes on the basis of material presented by the parties. Um, the, the problem is, I would say, exacerbated when it comes to multiple appointments. And absent an express and informed agreement to the contrary, multiple appointments can raise potential issues regarding apparent bias or justifiable doubts as, an arbitrator, as to an arbitrator's impartiality, as well as a potential inequality of arms between the parties, and it's best to be avoided where possible. The only real justification that can be offered is that there aren't enough arbitrators suitable to fit the bill. That's the so-called small pools exception. But the issue with small pools is, uh, in, as I would suggest, no more than a failure of conviction and imagination in the, arbitration, the arbitrator selection process. And invoking, invoking the small pools exception poses risks to the legitimacy of the arbitration system. So why should multiple appointments, particularly multiple appointments by the same party, uh, be seen as problematic? Well, there may be uh, a point reached where multiple ap appointments result in a situation where the arbitrator has some financial dependence on the appointing party with the perceived risk that the arbitrator may be dependent on that part, party or, or law firm for repeat uh, future business. But there's an additional perception point. There may be general concern that the reason that a party is appointing the same arbitrator, especially doing so in a particular type of case, where the party is expected to take the same position in similar types of disputes, might suggest that the arbitrator is predisposed towards appoint the appointing party or the position they intend to advance in the arbitration. The International Cotton Association addressed the issue of repeat or concurrent appointments by amending its arbitrator code of conduct so as to limit the number of appointments. The stated purpose of doing so was not only to avoid the risk of delay, which is the point that Bruce made, but also to avoid the perception of bias and partiality that could ar arise from repeat appointments. Now, Mr. A, a full-time arbitrator of raw cotton disputes, and if you didn't know before now that there is a career to be made a as a full-time arbitrator in raw cotton disputes, you know now, he challenged the amendment, uh, claiming that it resulted in a restraint of trade. Uh, David Foxton QC, sitting as a deputy judge of the High Court, dismissed the challenge, observing that perhaps because of his long experience as an ICA arbitrator and his understandable confidence in his own experience and standards, Mr. A found it difficult to see how the fact of repeat appointments might give rise to a legitimate perception of risk, of a risk of a lack of impartiality by an arbitrator. When one party to the most recent of those appointments asked Mr. A to provide details of the number of occasions on which he had been appointed by the other party, he did not believe this was information to which they were entitled. However, it is clear that the risk of a perception of lack of impartiality resulting from repeat appointments is a legitimate concern in the international arbitration community and one which, in my view, Mr. A has not sufficiently recognized. Now, the problem of self-policing and self-reporting, which is illustrated by that case, also um, features to some degree in Halliburton. Third, the risk ex exists beyond repeat appointments and may arise if a party or a law firm has simply appeared before the same arbitrator multiple times and the opposing party has not. This is, uh, speaks more pro broadly to an issue of inequality of arms and the problem of inside or insider knowledge. And one cannot ascertain precisely what precisely is the extent of that tactical advantage, precisely because the, of the privacy of the process and the confidentiality of, of the resulting award and the fact that most arbitral awards are not published. Donald Rumsfeld may have had a point. Fourth, the issue of inside knowledge is also problematic in appointing arbitrators in overlapping cases with one common party. This was recognized as a legitimate concern in Guidance LLC against Swiss Re, involving three overla overlapping insurance coverage disputes arising from U.S. litigation involving allegedly defective medical devices. It's another Bermuda form case. Guidant was the claimant in all three of the arbitrations. Swiss Re companies were defendants in two of them, and a different insurer, Markle, was the defendant in the third. Guidant sought the appointment of the same presiding arbitrator in all three arbitrations, arguing that having a common presiding arbitrator would re reduce costs and delay and minimize the risk of inconsistent decisions. Now, that approach was rejected by Mr. Justice Legas, as he then was, who noted that if the same person were to be appointed, there would be a legitimate concern that the person would be influenced 
in deciding the Swiss re-arbitrations by arguments and evidence in the Markle arbitration. Indeed, the likelihood that that would occur is implicit in the very argument which Guyton makes that the appointment of the same person would minim minimize the risk of inconsistent decisions or to adopt uh, Bruce's formulation, the more predictable uh, outcome. Swiss Re is not a party to the Markle arbitration and will have no opportunity to be heard in that arbitration or to influence its outcome. Indeed, without a waiver of confidentiality, they will not be privy to the evidence adduced or the submissions made in the Markle arbitration. And if the Markle arbitration were to be heard first, the members of the trib tribunal in that arbitration would form views without any input or opportunity from Swiss Re uh, with input from Swissery from which they may be slow to resile. Now, let's come to the small pools exception, uh, which is invoked uh, for, to, you know, as a way of justifying multiple appointments. Uh, Bruce noted the footnote in the IBA guidelines concerning commodities cases, and he says the same should apply in maritime disputes. Um, in the High Court decision in, in Halliburton, Mr. Justice Popperwell said that arbitration is chosen in many contracts as the preferred form of dispute resolution because the parties desire their tribunal to have particular knowledge and expertise in the law and practices of the business or markets in which the parties are operating. Arbitrators with such knowledge and expertise who command the confidence of the parties often comprise a limited pool of talent. It is undesirable that parties should be unnecessarily constrained in their ability to draw on this pool if there are multiple arbitrations arising out of a single event or overlapping circumstances. So that first justification is based on knowledge and expertise. And as I've already explained, the reliance on that knowledge and expertise may be misplaced and too much knowledge may indeed be a dangerous thing and can result in, an, in the risk of an arbitrator not fulfilling the fundamental duty of adjudicating, adjudicating the dispute between the parties on the material presented by them in the case in question. But secondly, if there is a particular market or other, uh, other understanding that is required in order to determine the dispute, and if that point is so apparent, there are other ways in which it can be conveyed without requiring pre-existing knowledge on the part of the arbitrator. Recall the, the approach of the Paris-based arbitration institution to the issue of trade usage, leaving it to the parties to present the necessary material. A related point is to ask whether such an understanding of small pools is universally held. It might be that within a small and geographically limited community, there could be unquestioning faith of a decision maker to be independent and impartial, a bit like Mr. A's own faith in his own ability to do that. But within, within a wider international audience, the notion of mutual confidence is less likely to be realistic. To be realistic. The Halliburton, just, Halliburton judgments themselves seem to adopt something of a don't worry, we all know him, he's a good bloke defense to the criticism of M. Those who do know M would absolutely agree that he's a good bloke. He once described my submissions in a case before him as valiant but hopeless. <laughs> and and I, I think he meant it in a nice way. Um, but that really isn't good enough to say that we know so-and-so and we trust him uh, to be able to put things out of his mind and approach the, the case uh, in an impartial way. Because that doesn't really work for those who don't know who M is and they are bound to be inherently suspicious of an approach that allows the self-policing that we saw with the case of Mr. A and to some extent uh, M himself. But fourth, are, are we not being... Uh, too picky in our choice of arbitrators, even in those um, specialist sectors. In the recent case of Pakistan Re against Equitas, a long-tail insurance claim in which the arbitration agreement required the tribunal to be consisted of persons employed or engaged in senior positions in insurance or reinsurance underwriting, and pausing there, that feels a little bit like what the parties wanted was an expert adjudication and not an arbitration, but never mind. In the case in question, the High Court dismissing an application to remove a sole arbitrator accepted the evidence of the sole arbitrator himself to the effect that market practice was to find someone who had knowledge and experience of the relevant contracts as they were at the relevant times. That is to say, between the years 1977 and 1984. Now, that created a very small pool indeed. That is a paddling pool of uh, available arbitrator candidates. And one wonders, uh, really, whether that... Uh, is, is, the, is the right uh, result. But are we not 
and this follows on from the last point, just limiting ourselves unnecessarily to a small pool. In addition to the fairness and impartiality concerns I've already raised, the consequences of a small pool, uh, and, and I would suggest that Bruce was far too accepting of this, that it's what the market expects. Uh, we rely upon our arbitrators who are, who are too much in demand, resulting in delay, as well as depriving others, a new generation, of the opportunity to become familiar with the issues by accepting appointments. There's a sort of self-perpetuating aspect to the small pools argument that says we, we don't allow others to come in and, and, and expand the pool. Um, Bruce has uh, anticipated a couple of things I was going to say as a way of ameliorating the, the problem. I do think there's a case for looking at party uh, nomination of arbitrators. Uh, and, and taking arbitrators with published biogs from a specialist uh, panel endorsed by the uh, body, the trade body, if not the arbitral institution in question. Um, there is, I, I think, a point about consolidation of disputes having the same underlying facts and other similarities that could be achieved by means of uh, in, uh, clauses in, in contracts or the adoption of institutional rules for those purposes. And thirdly, I think there is something to be said to, uh, for, for the International Cotton Association's approach of limiting the number of uh, repeat or concurrent appointments. They come up with the three, to three and eight rule. You can't have more than three and you can't do more than eight in a year. Um, where, um, uh, or, or, sorry, th th up to three appointments for a party or related party per calendar year and only eight at any one time. That was the eight and three rule, not the three and eight rule. Um, and fourthly, publication of awards. Um, Bruce um, worried about that, but I think the advantage of a party knowing how a particular arbitrator has decided a case, sanitised as appropriate, uh, helps to address this insider-outsider uh, problem of knowledge, um, which, as Paul Stanley observed in the Bermuda Forum disputes, may end up re revolving around a relatively limited number of issues that, that get decided. And that, that, that insider knowledge is mitigated if, if the information is available to others. So what I say is on the small pools point, the creation of them is the result of placing too much reliance on prior knowledge and not enough imagine, imagination being shown in the selection of arbitrators in certain types of disputes. The justification for the small pools exception is exaggerated and does not properly address the complications and the risk of harm that I see arising from multiple appointments. Nigel, thank you. Um, conscious of time and the uh, interest of getting yes. questions, do you well, want to say uh, uh, on the issue of disclosure, would you like to say something very quickly within two or three minutes and then Bruce can respond? I, I can say something on disclosure and if that is less the solution. That, I mean, a, a, lo a lot of the problems that we're talking about um, are fixed with proper disclosure and I think the arbitration system would benefit from and welcome a rigorous approach to, to disclosure. It avoids challenges late in the day and a huge waste of, of cost and time. Look what's happened in Halliburton itself. There was a, a, an issue about uh, disclosure for which M was, was uh, criticized. He acknowledged that with the benefit of hindsight, he might have made an earlier disclosure. If that had been done and if the, if the standards and, and the expectation were such that disclosure has to be made, we could do with uh, clarifying the status of the IBA guidelines as a matter of English law. They are widely used and they reflect to some degree the expectations of the international arbitration community that comes to London to, to, to deal with its disputes. And I think that is very often going to be the, pro the, the way of dealing with the insider uh, knowledge problem, which particularly arises in the case of multiple appointments, overlapping cases. So I say disclose and be damned, that's the solution. Bruce, would you just like to respond to I'll the disclosure very, issue? I shall be very brief. Uh, but just a couple of points arising on what Nigel said earlier. Uh, first of all, uh, small pools, I think, are going to be inevitable because it, the market will con can always appoint the people that it wants to appoint, the people that it respects and thinks are decent arbitrators. And they will, the numbers are bound to be limited. Uh, it's suggesting that the fact they exist doesn't allow for any expansion is simply false because as... <laughs> People die or retire, others come along and are <laughs> appointed by the market. That's the way it works. It always has done. It's good in a dead man's shoes. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, sorry. 
And as for the ICA, International Cotton Association, you can't take more than three appointments from the same source in one year, and you mustn't have more than eight cases running in one year. Well, that's completely bonkers from the point of view, at least of maritime arbitrators. I hate to think how many cases I've got in my filing cabinet. I, 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 take, I take a limited number of appointments a year, but it's, it's rather more than three from any one firm if, if they happen to offer them. Now, any suggestion that maritime arbitrators should adopt a policy of disclosure as outlined in the IBA guidelines is, is very unreal. As I've already said, multiple appointments from the same firm of lawyers are inevitable. That doesn't mean that these appointments concern the same parties. On the contrary, the same parties turn up relatively rarely in our cases. But we know that our, most of our cases, in fact, concern insurers, which may be legal cost insurers. But very often, we don't know which insurers are involved but they are effectively our paymasters. How can we possibly declare their involvement when we don't actually know of it? Yet someone might suggest that because the same insurer is arranging for an arbitrator to be appointed time and again, he's bound to declare that fact, even though he cannot. Now, I believe that some of my colleagues would be discouraged from continuing to practice by having to go through their records in order to satisfy some duty of disclosure of, for example, multiple appointments from the same firm. So that in itself, if I'm right, would probably reduce the number of the available arbitrators, or at least competent ones. Moreover, I believe that such extensive disclosure, as may be advocated, could in fact, would in fact, lead to more challenges. Happily to date, challenges on the basis of bias have been very rare, at least in shipping cases. I can't remember the last one that was upheld. It was probably before I was born. But it seems to me inconceivable that if parties, by which I really mean lawyers, were given the opportunity to raise a challenge to someone they didn't particularly like as an arbitrator, they would not take that. It's inconceivable that they would not take that opportunity once the relevant material was presented to them. And indeed, I, I think that since the institutions uh, introduced their requirements as to disclosure, the number of challenges have in fact increased quite appreciably. Further, one of the effects of a challenge being raised is that the arbitrator in question will very often offer his resignation so as to avoid any further problems, even though the challenge may be unmeritorious. That runs counter to the right of a party to have its own first choice nominee as arbitrator. So I'm satisfied that excessive regulation would lead to a reduction in the number and or quality of arbitrators being appointed. This would damage London, more poor quality arbitrators would be appointed, and or more ex-judges or barristers. Neither is what the market wants. The market wants to appoint its chosen arbitrators, and I would expect that to be true in other areas, not simply in shipping. And the market is familiar with the status quo, even if the new small ship owner, for example, from another country, isn't himself acquainted with the situation, his lawyers and his insurers certainly will be, and that knowledge must surely be imp imputed to him. I believe that, in truth, there is no great problem in this area at all. And I say that not only in relation to maritime arbitration, but also to so-called international arbitration. At the end of the day, each case must be looked at on its own facts. And in most cases, the facts are unique. Far better to leave the question to the courts when, rarely, an, a real issue arises. If, sadly, the Supreme Court decides to lay down some strict guidelines for disclosure or anything of that kind, I can only hope that it will be it will provide a carve-out for maritime and commodities arbitrations. The LMAA will be seeking leave to intervene in the appeal to seek something of the sort. But my real hope is that that will not be necessary. We have long managed to work with common sense. By definition, that cannot be codified because it all depends on the circumstances. Regulation and codification, while sometimes overlapping with common sense, often fly in the face of it. Whether the Supreme Court, which currently seems to adopt a rather high moral stance, will see things that way can only be the subject of our prayers. <laughs> and as a postscript, can I say that the London Maritime Arbitrators Association terms on the basis of which we all work uh, provide for us to have the power to order concurrency between arbitrations raising similar issues, whether of fact or of law or both. And that provides a very convenient solution to uh, any question of extra knowledge being acquired by an arbitrator as a result of having different appointments in related disputes. Thank you. And thank you for your allowing me that time. Thank you very much, Bruce.
thank you to Bruce and Nigel for an excellent argument from both sides. Um, obviously, there are very important issues, and we wait with bated breath as to what happens in the Halliburton case in the Supreme Court. Um, we've got about 15 to 20 minutes for questions and answers, so I open up the floor to anybody who would like to ask a question. Um, I'm doing my Fiona Bruce impression here, so to the gentleman there. Yes, please. If you could say who you are and your question. My name is Michael. This is on. I'm, my name is Michael Lampert. I'm an American arbitrator. Um, Earlier this year, the federal appeals court that sits in New York rendered a decision not without controversy, concluding that the standards to be applied to a party-appointed arbitrator were rather different from the standards to be applied to a president, umpire, neutral, call them what you will. There was some peripheral reference to that, but I wonder whether some of the reconciliation of the factors that were described in the debate in fact, what the position of the debaters would be on whether that reconciliation should vary depending on whether we're talking about a party-appointed arbitrator or an umpire or neutral. Thank you for your question. Um, it's an issue that I think is addressed in some commentary, um, whether there should be different standards for party-appointed as opposed to chairman uh, or chairperson of a tribunal. Nigel, would you like to answer that first, and then I'll ask you. Yeah, I, I would say that there is no meaningful standards of impartiality and independence and approaching the case with an open mind should be the same whether it's a party nominated arbitrator or a chair. You'll recall that M was appointed as the presiding arbitrator in, in one of the references that gave rise to the issue in, in Halliburton. Yes, the party nomination of an arbitrator is a relevant consideration, and I mentioned that point in, in responding to what, judge, uh, what Bruce said about judges, but I, I don't think that there can be any separation of the role. What it leads you to suggest is if you were to hold the presiding arbitrator to a higher standard, it might encourage the party appointed arbitrator to be more advocates than themselves independent and impartial, trusting the, the presiding arbitrator to, to um, approach the thing in a, in a more neutral way. So I, I would be for saying that there should be no such distinction. Bruce? I, I can't disagree with that. Uh, there should be no distinction. Come on, Bruce. No, no, I, I can't <laughs> <to> disagree. <laughs> I've been smacking my brain, but I can't think of a reason. The, the, they've done well to disagree so far. So, uh, um, this gentleman at the front. Thank you, Francesco Bentivegna from London. Uh, I'm not completely sure if this question is really connected with the topic of tonight, but it has to do with independence appointments, impartiality. So maybe I hope, and unless I ask the question, I will never know the answer. Um, Last week in, in Cambridge, uh, two days of a very interesting conference, um, a very eminent speaker projected figures, a few figures about the number of uh, dissenting opinions. The dissenting opinion is the opinion that, uh, as, as we know, that the party, normally the ex-party arbitrator, the arbitrator appointed by the party, has the right to express his dissent from the opinion of the majority. So the figure was nearly 100%, which is not a surprise somehow, but that was the, 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 the figure uh, confirmed, that almost 100% of dissenting opinion reflects the opinion of the party which appointed that arbitrator. Now, we all know, all the books say that we have had ample debate at LCIA about this, that uh, the moment in which the arbitrator, of course, is appointed, has to declare his impartiality, independence, disclosure, there are all the possible ways. How you gentlemen, with your experience and prestige in your profession, can you explain this or how this is compatible with the idea of impartiality? If at the end of the day, the ex parte arbitrator, in the totality of the case, when he expressed a dissenting opinion, is the opinion of the party which appointed him, definitely not to the other party. Thank you. Just to summarize, I think the issue is the statistics reveal that party appointed arbitrators seem to sway in a particular way the decision goes, and that raises those concerns that you're talking about. So, Bruce? This reflects exactly what I said about what ha has happened in New York maritime arbitration, where the majority of awards are made by a majority, and the dissent is always from the losing party's nominee. Now, this, it, it's interesting to contrast this with <coughs> the experience in London maritime arbitration. I don't know about so-called international arbitration, but in London maritime arbitration, 
my experience is that probably there is a dissent or a disagreement between arbitrators in less than 1% of our cases. And I, I had one wonderful experience when I was chairing a tribunal many years ago. And at the conclusion, the party appointed arbitrators were discussing the matter. And after about 20 minutes of very heated debate, I giggled. And they turned to me and said, what are you laughing at? And I said, well, you, you do realize that you're arguing the case of the party appointed by him and vice versa, don't you? And they said, yes, so what? <laughs> Ultimately, they agreed. But uh, it, it all depends on the arbitrators and, and the way they behave. Nigel, do you think it taints the process at all with those statistics? Well, one would need to know a little bit more about yeah. the nature of those cases before forming, drawing any, any real conclusions. I mean, my, my own experience, and that's all I can, I can really go on, um, and you invited us to comment from yes. that vantage point, is that arbitrators in cases that I've concerned with have been absolutely scrupulous in, in observing a, the standards of independence, independence and in, impartiality. Um, and yes, one can see instances where the dissent follows the lines of party nomination. It, it hasn't particularly been my experience. I, I agree that it's, it's troubling if, if, if that um, is, is, is borne out uh, across the board. But, I mean, Bruce talked about New York, but, but I thought you said, Bruce, that the, the problem there was as a result of the publication. I think it may well have resulted from publication because it, that resulted in arbitrators being chosen for specific views which they previously expressed. Yes. But I think I, I would say that you know, the, the standard, the gold standard that we expect of arbitrators appointed in commercial disputes here in London and elsewhere is that they should be held, whether it's party nominated or chair, however they're appointed to, to, to the same standard of independence and impartiality. And the, stri the strive to, 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 to produce unanimous awards does result to some degree in, in that debate in, in, in deliberations where I think, as Bruce observed, um, we hope that, that arbitrators forget who they're appointed by and just try to get to the right result. Thank you. Further questions? The lady at the back. Yes. Thank you, Catherine uh, Jonquier, Three Crowns London. Um, I just wanted to touch upon the small pools issue, which was discussed by both speakers. And I note that Mr. Harris is of the view that you're bound to have this small pool of arbitrators. It's inevitable. It's a product of the market. And I wonder, is that right, though? Isn't it the case that parties appoint whom they know and trust? And the more people, the more arbitrators they know, the more arbitrators will be appointed and the more varied the pool will be. And then a second question I had is that Mr. Rodding um, didn't agree with you. And he said that, um, you said that um, perhaps we could be a bit more imaginative in appointing arbitrators. And I was wondering whether you have any views as to how concretely we might do that. Thank you for the question. Do you want to go, Bruce, first, and then we can... It's a big issue, obviously, the issue of diversity and pool size generally in the arbitration world, but specifically, um, if you go first, Bruce, just... Yeah, I, I do remain of the view that it is inevitable that there will be small pools one way or another. They may be slightly larger or they'll be slightly smaller, but they will always be somehow limited, I think, naturally, by market choice. And if you want an example, in the London Maritime Arbitrators Association, we have, as I said, 30 full members currently. But we also have a list of um, about 15 or 20 people published uh, described as aspiring full members. In other words, people who want to get appointments, want to be maritime arbitrators. And in addition to that, we have a, a whole category of hundreds of supporting members, some of whom have indicated that they are willing to accept appointments. The fact is that most of those people in those two categories get very few appointments. And if they do get some appointments, a, a decent number, then they're going to become full members. But that will probably be sometime in the future, when I won't be around, for, for one reason or another. <laughs> um, but it, it, it just shows you that we have a whole list of probably 30 or 40 people who are indicating they're willing to accept appointment, and they do this to the maritime arbitration community, in, published they're not getting much work. 
Can I ask Nigel, probably slightly different on that? I mean, there is an issue. Um, I think Bruce is saying it's a fact that it's a limited pool. But leading on from the question from um, the ladies, is there any steps in terms of expanding that pool? And also, you are a practitioner. Do you think it's clients and lawyers who share some kind of responsibility to be able to expand that paddling pool, as you called it? Yes. Well, I'm not sure I have a silver bullet, but what I think I can say is that we have seen some progress, there's a long way to go, some progress in, in the field of gender diversity on arbitration tribunals. Jackie has been at the forefront of that from an LCA perspective. In the law firms, we're working harder to try to make sure that on a short list there will be at least one woman candidate. Um, in my own experience, it's the clients who are the most conservative. The law firms can come up with suggestions for party nomination, but it's the clients who want to appoint somebody they know and trust and can rely upon and have got loads of experience. But you, you just have to keep chipping away. Um, the same analysis really applies to the... I, I think it's just too easy to accept that the, the, the small pools are what they are and the market demands them. I think everybody's got to work harder at expanding that. Um, a former partner of mine who was, who was one of the founding fathers of the Pressfields arbitration practice famously said 30 years ago, I don't know whether it was a proclamation or a confession, he said, what I'm looking for in, in a party-nominated arbitrator is somebody with the maximum predisposition in favor of my client with the minimum appearance of bias. Now, that's still the approach that many people adopt. In the intervening 30-year period, my ambition has become much less than that. All I really want is somebody who's going to read the papers and not to decide the case before I open my mouth on the first day of the hearing. And that opens up, actually, a bigger pool of people who are just able lawyers. You, you, you can look at, at, at the CVs and what they've done, and you don't depend upon that. I mean, you know, you, you see the same influence in, in certainly in oil and gas cases. The construction. Same names come up, construction, which Suba knows a lot about. Happens. I think we just got to be a bit braver and a bit bolder in expanding the pool. Um, it's definitely with the red tie. Thank you very much. And Andrew Stevens for Pump Court Chambers. Uh, I've had the pleasure recently of giving lectures and seminars on the Halliburton case in uh, Dubai, London, Hong Kong, and various cities in China, so not just in London. And during each seminar, I've conducted a straw poll. And on the question of whether M should have disclosed the appointments, the answer is overwhelmingly yes. On the issue of should he have been removed, the answer is often not yes. There's a, a small yeah. um, minority uh, that thinks he should have been removed. And the controversy here really in Halliburton is about whether there should have been a finding of a perception of bias, essentially. Isn't the elephant in the room on this issue that it's a hot topic not because of increased instances of people actually perceiving bias? <coughs> Mr. Rawling made the point that in his experience most arbitrators are absolutely scrupulous. Isn't the issue really that you've got clever lawyers taking every point they possibly can, especially where their client has a bad case, a weak case, and you want to cause delay and disruption to the process? or where their client has lost for whatever reason, and they simply want a second bite at the cherry. Thank you for that question. And it's very interesting that uh, you get this view globally. I think I mean, it raises the issue of striking a balance between giving weight to parties who have genuine cause for concern of bias uh, against the ability for a party to frustrate the process for strategic and tactical reasons. And that's the balance that the courts and the rules have to apply. I think um, the, rule, the phrase that I kept hearing when I was researching for this is that non-disclosure in and of itself, and this is a bit that I underlined, was without something more isn't going to be biased. It's not going to be automatically biased. It might tend that way. Um, Nigel, do you want to comment on the point made? I think it's a very interesting fascinated by the straw yeah. poll results. Um, I, I think, th I come back to my, my point about disclosure as, as being the cure. N no, nobody wants to encourage unmeritorious challenges. Bruce made a point about in information generating more, more, more challenges, but an early disclosure, the answer of, of a case, I, I think can, is, the, is, is by far the lesser 
the, 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 the results in the lesser evil. You may describe it as a sort of do-it-yourself hangman's kit when you put it all out there, um, but that's the opportunity. And one of the features of the Halliburton case is that there was an earlier opportunity uh, to challenge or object to the appointment which wasn't taken. Um, and and uh, it seems to me that that disclosure point, it, it, when you give the opportunity there by the information available at the earliest possible stage, that can sort of lance the boil or take the sting out of the later challenge, the one that you're particularly concerned mm. about, where you don't like the result and you, and you, you challenge later. Bruce? Don't you like I'm to add anything to, to it? Say, I largely agree again. <laughs> yeah. No, that's fine. That's but, fine. I, but, I, but I also agree that I suspect that the problem really does, like, as you said, Andrew, it's an elephant in the room. The lawyers, the clever lawyers, are being obstructive because their client's lost or is, is likely to lose. And I, I do still think that uh, more disclosure, at least in our cases, would simply lead to more challenges at an early stage uh, and people resigning and dropping out, which would be very unfortunate. To be replaced by that new generation of lawyers that, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, that uh, they're all designed to encourage. Why lawyers? No, no, why lawyers? That's I fair. I, I did oh, as well, in fairness. Sorry. Sorry. We've, we've got a few more minutes. Um, I, I'll just come to you in one second. One of the issues I picked up before, and you know, in a, from a pragmatic point of view, I think I was right that M had offered to resign, but Chubb had declined to give consent to that resignation. I mean, from a practical point of view, and I understand that parties wouldn't want to concede that, but that, I don't know what their thinking was other than, well, we want this person, would have been a way out which they didn't take, unfortunately. So this gentleman. Um, first of all, I should make... Can I? Yes, we can hear you. Sorry. Um, I should make disclosure that I am... Yes, I, I, well, I'm making my disclosure. I'm a practicing London Maritime Arbitrator and President of the London Maritime Arbitrators Association, so I do have an interest. Um, Does he have a name? Just one point of information. We do have a right of appeal against arbitration awards in London unless you exclude it. Uh, which the LCIA, of course, does. But in the maritime world, it's regarded as a sing singular plus and a major selling point for London. So there are differences between industries on that. But as far as the position of judges are concerned, much of what you said may be right, but the opportunity to appeal from a decision of an arbitration award is indeed there and is used. Um, I just wanted to ask uh, you, Nigel, about how far you agree with the practice of interviewing potential arbitrators uh, to find out the way they're going to go? And, or do you find out the way they're going to go? Or do you just find out about what their previous decisions or their previous opinions may have been about the, uh, the subject matter of the case? How far is it legitimate to go in interviewing a potential arbitrator? Thank you for that question. Do you want to answer it? Uh, no, I'm not, that's a question addressed to Nigel. Nigel. I, I would like to take a checkbook with you. And, uh, uh, I mean, absolutely not. Uh, to, the way you put it, to find out the way the arbitrator is going to go, absolutely not. It is perfectly valid to have a, a, a conversation about <coughs> availability, um, trying to establish whether there might be any conflicts of interest that might emerge uh, down the line, but certainly not to try to get some insight at that stage in an ex parte communication to how the arbitrator might think at that point. Um, when it comes to party nominated arbitrators, my experience also it's, it's perfectly legitimate to have a conversation about what the profile of the presiding arbitrator might be, what characteristics that, that person should or should not have, but certainly not um, trespassing into the nature of the case or the arguments that, that, that arise. Thank you. That sounds a bit Pollyanna-ish, and kind of, no, no, no. It, it is my experience. Thank you for that. Nigel, do you want to add to well, that? I, I just think that, that must be right, but it's not something that even arises in maritime arbitration, at least in my experience. Okay, thank you. Um, Jackie, may I ask, we started 10 minutes late, I think, so I think we've still got five minutes. Is that okay? Um, the gentleman at the back there, please. Um, Joseph O'Two from Mayor Brown. Um, I just wanted to touch um, touch on the, the, the comments about um, um, the, the market dictating um, the pool of arbitrators and the knowledge experience. And to follow up from from the ladies' comments, now I had a look on <coughs> on the LMA website for the arbitrators, and there's lots of eminent people on there. But out of the 35 members, there's only two women. 
So what I wanted to ask is, uh, uh, on the basis that you're, the LMA are trying to continue to be the leading um, uh, maritime arbitration um, body for the next 10 to 15 years, how are you, uh, what steps are you taking? How do you um, um, find, how are you going to be able to, to maintain that leading position when you, you've got such a, a, a small pool, including only, only two women? I'm not sure that Bruce is in charge of no, uh, the whole the process. Over there. <laughs> <laughs> and the question should be directed to one of the audience members, which would be most unfair. Um, uh, would you mind briefly answering? It's a bit unconventional not to ask panellists, but an audience member. But given the role you have, that might be helpful. Um, first of all, there are three. Uh, in fact, rather than <laughs> two, but... Um, and uh, there are also a number on our panel of um, aspiring full members, and I hope that in due course they will um, also uh, become full members. Um, there are certainly more uh, women in, not only in arbitration generally, but also in maritime arbitration than was the case uh, when I became an arbitrator 10 years ago. And uh, we hope and expect that trend to continue. Um, a lot of the, uh, the power is within the arbitrators. We are not an arbitrating institution in the way in which the LCIA is, and therefore I do not have the power to make anything like the sort of numbers of appointments that the LCIA do as a proportion of the total appointments. But um, we do seek to appoint uh, uh, female arbitrators in uh, default cases. We encourage the P&I clubs, who are the major funders of maritime uh, arbitration to appoint uh, women arbitrators. Uh, the, the industry is undoubtedly a conservative one, but there are both more women in um, solicitors' firms who may make appointments or who may become arbitrators. There are more women in P&I clubs as case handlers who may make uh, arbitration appointments. There are also more women in uh, the management, senior management positions in shipping companies. There were almost none 10 years ago. And all that, I hope, will contribute to um, an increase in the numbers of appointments of women and, and also of women becoming full members. And we are certainly very much open to women becoming full members uh, if they have the confidence of the market and they are able to uh, themselves attract appointments just like everybody else. Thank you for that. I think we've got time for two, question, two more questions, and then we'll finish. The gentleman there who's been handed in a few times. Hi, if I may somewhat unfairly sort of categ uh, classify the, the two positions. Uh, the gentleman on the left, uh, uh, Mr. Rawling, appears to be more of an institutionalist and views the, the natural value of arbitration as an institution to the extent that he actually takes expert determination as, as something quite different to arbitration, whereas uh, Mr. Harris seems to see the primary value being the party's consent or the, the party's uh, contractual will here. And I was just wondering, you know, if we were to see the UK Supreme Court or Parliament, if it stops behaving like a bunch of pullocks, decide to amend the arbitration legislation in the United Kingdom, or if there's a, a general shift, particularly with regards to international arbitration, towards Mr. Rawling's, posi uh, Rawling's position, um, what's going to stop um, parties from simply avoiding using the word arbitration, but creating the same sort of institution um, that you're, 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 we're finding difficulty with? You know, what, what would prevent the maritime industry by simply changing the way the P&I club letters are, are written? Um, you know, creating some sort of a new uh, alternative to alternative dispute resolution or, or, or something like that. If Mr. Uh, Harris's position about the market is correct. Um, you know, will, will we not just find, you know, creative and sometimes arrogant lawyers creating new inventive ways to get their clients unjustice um, if, if we, we over-institutionalize things? Thank you for the question. I'm not quite understood, but there may be issues of enforceability, etc. Uh, one of the attractions of arbitration is its enforceability. So if you rebadge it as something else, whether it will carry the same weight uh, is open to question, but I don't know if you want to say a couple of yeah, things. And, and perhaps to say that um, <coughs> not my experience of the use of institutional rules has never been any sense to depart from the principle of party autonomy or consent to the, the process of arbitration, which by means of that consent is under, in the terms of the contract that one, one adopts a set of rules such as those of the RCIA and other institutions. It's equally the case that in ad hoc cases, the principle of party consent is the foundation 
production. I do think there is some there is an argument to say that in certain industries, such as the maritime industry that, that Lisa knows such a lot about, commodities and other sectors and trades and trade, actually a process of export adjudication would be a more suited process and avoid some of the industries that you have been talking about. Certainly in the shipping industry, our preference is to invest more in the Uh, yes, first of all, um, can I say, from your, you, you referred to the gentleman on, your, on the left. Well, from my point of view, he's on the right, and, that's, and he's being very conservative. He is on the right, and I'm on the left. Um, no, I, I think as a practical matter, uh, certainly in, in my field, it, in fact, expert determination is, would be possible in a tiny proportion of cases in any event, uh, or some sort of other form of adjudication, because we're always dealing with mixed questions of fact and law, uh, and th those are not susceptible to uh, expert adjudication or determination. When there is a case that is simply de dependent on such a matter, then in the past it has happened that uh, the parties have appointed an expert or an arbitrator who himself is an expert in the field. Cedric Barclay was the best example. He'd go around a ship that was uh, just being constructed or just had been constructed and the owners were complaining about various defects and he'd make mini oral awards as he went saying well now that one's that's a defect that's got to be re repaired that's not a defect and so on but that's that was in the past and uh, I don't think it's going to happen very much in the future. Okay. Conscious time we've just got one last question um, who would like to any minutes um, the lady there. Hello everyone, I'm Hello everyone. Uh, no. Can you can you speak up? It's still not working. Do you want to just sh oh, there's one last mic there. Yeah. the panel about the topic which you have been discussing today. Do you agree that all this problem would not have arisen if we had a proper code of conduct and ethics for arbitrators? What are your views on that? We have the, the IBO guidelines, but they are only soft law. I, uh, just for the benefit of those who may not have heard it, I'll summarise that would all of this problem have gone away if there was a binding code of ethics and conduct amongst arbitrators? Um, I will let the panellists answer, but I suspect all the institutional rules themselves, as well as the law, has an underlying obligation, for example, to act impartially uh, and act fairly um, as being a guidance to conduct, but Nigel, if you I, go first. I, I agree. I mean, it's a combination of, of statute, institutional rules, thing, so additional sources such as the IBO guidelines. It seems to me to give everything an arbitrator needs to decide whether disclosure is appropriate or whether circumstances might arise that, that means that he or she is not in a position to take on any sort of legal breach with the obligation of impartiality. So I, I don't see much of a need or room for um, a, a, a new source. I mentioned parenthetically that in the Halliburton case itself, there was an opportunity yeah. uh, at an early stage of the proceedings to, to make an objection which wasn't taken on, so the problem might be solved at, at that stage. Yes, I have nothing to add. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it just leaves me to thank both um, the uh, debaters for their excellent presentations and answering the questions and also to uh, the audience for all the questions, but I'll hand over. Thank you. Thank also our moderator. And uh, everyone is now, of course, invited to have a drink and continue the discussion outside um, for a little while with us all together. Thank you for having come. Good night. Thank you.